from the Dallas On Air studios in beautiful Dallas, Texas. This is Fulfillment right here on DallasOnAir.com. And now here's your hosts, the Vega Bomber, PJ Dunn, and the film samurai, Carlos Salinas. Yes. Well, all right, all right. Welcome, 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 welcome to season two, season two. episode 16. 16. Carlos. Sweet 16. 16. Yes, sir. <laughs> Man, so we've done decades, we've talked about best female directors and actors, we've talked about pretty much everything movies, so today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about, well this is going to be kind of interesting, we're going to talk about those who were gone too soon. Mm -hmm. What we want to do is we want to celebrate what they were able to do in the short amount of time that most of these folks that we're going to talk about today did it. Yeah. But when you think about uh, gone too soon, uh, mm -hmm. Carlos, what, what do you think about when you hear yeah, that? Yeah, it's it's those people that, you know, they pass away and, and you're immediately, first you're shocked, you know, like, oh my God, this person has 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 died suddenly. And then you start thinking, God, he really, he really passed away too soon. What could have been, you know, if he had, you know, remained alive, you know, the potential there, you know, there's always that potential when you lose somebody too soon. Uh, it's a tragedy because you miss out on what could have been, you know, yeah. that for me anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Zach, what do you think, bro? Absolutely. I mean, it, it, a lot of times it's lost potential. A lot of times it's just the person's left such an impact mm -hmm. on not only you, but the cultural zeitgeist, the, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the way things are viewed, the way that, you know, people view other people. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know when you when you have a soul that has affected you so deeply that you know their their departure lives with you for you know ages and ages, uh, it's go it leaves an impact on you because uh, again that that person is sincerely and fully removed from you. Mm -hmm. um, and you know when when the cult's personality and celebrities and things like that, we take it because it was someone who belonged to all of us. Yeah. You know. And they were willing to give themselves to us yeah. uh, for our enjoyment, for our for our lives and entertainment. Yeah? That's absolutely right. And I think this gives us a chance to think about how inspired we can be because we still have our time in life to still do great things. And these mm -hmm. people serve as almost like a mentor even past the, the, their, their lifetime because you think of, well, look what this person did in just four years, mm -hmm. what this person did in just five years. And we're gonna look at some very interesting people for that. So if this is your first time at Fulfillment, this is a show where we talk about everything movies. We talk about movie collectibles, we talk about directors, actors, scripts, the whole bit. If you love movies beyond just flashy cinematography, then this is definitely the show for you. And so what I have to my right is my trusty sidekick, the film samurai, if you don't know that already. <laughs> And also, the big voice behind the camera that you can't see is Kazak. Oz. That's it. That's it. So, with that, let's just jump in to our first segment, which is uh -huh. Just Seen It. And as always, we start with the film Samurai. What have you just seen, Carlos? All right. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I saw this movie two weeks ago, mm -hmm. but I recently saw it again yesterday because I just want to see it again. It's one of those films that... Christopher Nolan I'm talking about you know every Christopher Nolan film that comes out is an event for a lot of movie buffs you know I'm a particular Christopher Nolan fan you can call me a fanboy if you want um, I love all of his movies uh, Tenet uh, the first time I watched it I, I had to go see it in IMAX it was filmed in IMAX of course um, it's it's what you would imagine if Christopher Nolan did a a serious James Bond film, you know, mm -hmm. it takes place all over the world. There's a lot of espionage type things. There's a, a villain. There's almost kind of like a Bond girl. Mm -hmm. And uh, John David Washington, Robert Pattinson are the leads. Uh, Kenneth Branagh plays the, plays the villain. Uh, Elizabeth Debicki, um, this beautiful tall actress, she was in um, The Man from Uncle. Okay. She was kind of like the villain in that movie, and uh, she plays a interesting role in this uh nolan gets criticized for his female roles you know how he always has this thing about dead wives or dead girlfriends but um i don't know i don't know about that but uh mm -hmm. this movie is 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 fantastic um uh, i the first time i watched it i kind of like sat back in awe of the visual you know nolan is a, a big movie maker yeah uh he's a great storyteller 
Mm -hmm. uh, he's not using Zimmer this time, so this so this so the score is different, and it's interesting. It's almost almost like a, a hmm, experimental type score. It, it, you really kind of notice it, mm. but it works for the film. I mean. Uh, Everything is is perfectly crafted in a way. He didn't use a lot of CGI, every, a lot of practical effects in this film. Uh, it's not a time travel movie. Uh, it's called time inversion, where things that haven't happened yet are, are coming like backwards and forwards at the same time. It's real hard to explain. You just got to watch it. It's not that hard to figure out. I, I've heard responses from critics or, or people that said, I, I didn't understand anything. I couldn't figure out what was going on. It's not that hard to figure out, and it, and if you, and even to the point of where I kind of predicted what was really going to happen by the end of the movie. Okay, it's, it's, I mean you can almost tell it from the trailer, uh, but yeah, it's it's a mind blowing movie, and uh, it's not. I, I would say it's not one of Nolan's best movies. I put it in the mid somewhere. Okay, uh, but John David Washington is is great in it. Uh, mm -hmm. Pattinson, he's he's an interesting actor. He he's perfect for this role, and um, everybody in the in the movie is is great. There's not that many characters, but uh, and John David the Washington. way he crafted this movie to work, mm -hmm. you know, I, I do know Nolan does have a fascination with time and how it works and moves. Mm -hmm. uh, so this movie is just another example of that. So yeah, I was just kind of blown away by it by the end. Right, Inception, Memento, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Dunkirk, okay. even. Yeah. Okay, so because I because I'm conflicted on this because I really wanted to see this in IMAX the way it was meant to be seen. Yeah. And that's not going to happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that's just not going to happen. Yeah. So understand. Well, so one of my local theaters is doing this as a drive-in movie. Mm -hmm. Does it translate in 2D on a oh. smaller screen? I That's think a you're gonna great question. you're gonna miss out on the sound. Well, I, I take that back. Cause cause, I mean, I'm in my car, so yeah, you're right. gonna have a, if you if you got a decent sound system, I I think you'll be fine. Uh, I'm I'm interested to see your feedback after you hear it because there was a lot of complaints about the movie being too loud, drowning out dialogue, like Dunkirk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind of. You know, and it's interesting too because I saw it in IMAX and then I saw it in XD at the Cinemark up in Allen, and yeah. the sound was actually better in the XD. The the, the the AMC IMAX I saw at the North Park. It, it, by comparison, I, I I preferred the XD sound, and uh, yeah, if you miss dialogue here and there, it's not that important. But you get the gist of the film. If gotcha. you miss something, you know. But uh, yeah, I'd like to be interested in seeing that. I think you'll be fine. Okay. I mean, All right. I'm, it's, it's more vi visually oriented than anything. Yeah. You but, know, they have the exposition dumps, of course, but. It's, it's not as much as right. some I'm, of his previous Right. Stuff. I'm just trying to justify spending $20 to go watch this in my car. Oh, you know, that, yeah. that, that's the thing. Wow. Yeah. Yep. Because, I mean, cause, I mean I'll, I'll go watch a trash movie, you know, and, and, and as a drive-in yeah, movie. Because, yeah. you know, that's what I do. But I don't know if I can, it's, justify, it's, I can, know if I can justify that price for it's me, not me the and best, my spouse. You know? Not the best way to see it, but <laughs> if that's the only then, way yeah. you can see it, yeah. I, the, I think I'm going to skip it and just wait for, for a DVD at home, man. Watch yeah. It, yeah, watch it at home. Yeah, so you got John David Washington, Denzel Washington's son. Yeah. Who you oh. might, he's who even you got might, that that Denzel strut, you know, when he's yeah. walking, he's you know, he's dressed up in the movie, you know, in suits and stuff, like James Bond almost. Mm -hmm. But yeah, he's got that little move of of his father. It's yeah. interesting to watch it. Right. Yeah. So he was in Black Klansman too. So if you're wondering what was David John David Washington before that, it was Black Klansman most recently. Mm -hmm. What about you, Kazak? What have you seen since we last saw each other? Okay, so for me, uh, I picked up a series on uh, Netflix that I missed the first time around, and I'm glad that they brought it over to Netflix because it came up on YouTube as a subscription series. Just like, I'm not going to pay that. <laughs> right. Uh, so uh, so what I'm talking about is uh, Cobra Kai. Yes. Uh, okay. Th this, okay. This has been an absolute fantastic follow-up mm -hmm. uh, to The Karate Kid. You have uh, original actors coming back uh, to do this TV series uh, where basically uh, uh, jo uh, Johnny is now the good guy, the protagonist. Ralph Macchio is the antagonist. Right. Uh, you know, with you know, Ralph Macchio's got the great life, and Johnny's had the just terrible life. It's it's that reversal of fortune mm. uh, that just kind of all came down. You and you see this, you know, Johnny now is this broken guy mm -hmm. having to make his comeback, and he's making his comeback through you know. Uh, you know, uh, kids at the high school, so it's it, it's it's just been an interesting juxtaposition because there are no real bad guys 
in this movie. It's just different points of view. Okay. Except for but, the original sensei of Cobra Kai. Well, that uh, was well, a pretty bad view. But John Kreese is just John Kreese. Yeah. But, <laughs> I, but I mean, everyone fulfills their role like they should have. Yes. I mean, it's just a it's great continu- It's a, just a great continuation of the Karate Kid films. If you love the Karate Kid movies, this is just a perfect, really mm-hmm. perfect follow-up. You know, you can you can forget you know three and four. But, yeah. yeah. But but you know this. Oh this one gosh. is just an absolutely fantastic. The Jaden Smith one? Oh. Oh, no, I was talking about the Hillary Swank one. Oh, God. I, but you know, Trudy. Will Smith is actually the executive producer on this. Really? Yes. That's good note to know. So, so like I said, there it, it's all in there, and, the, and it, it's it's just well thought out. It's yeah. well put together, and it's just really enjoyable. Go go check out the series if you love the Karate Kid series. I'm loving it. I'm gonna have to jump on that. I so second all that, by the way. You second that as yep. well. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, then that's that's an all good. Then that's a all the way around thumbs up. The film that I watched was a film I'd already seen before. Again, there's a, a good friend of mine who wanted to kind of watch some of these uh, films that had to do with more of the black African American heroes and people that were doing real well. So the film that I picked was Marshall to mm-hmm. show him. I thought he would really like this. So this film was released in 2017. It's about one of my Big time heroes, Thurgood Marshall, the first black uh, super, su- Supreme Court justice and NAACP lawyer, traveling lawyer at the time. And so this film is great. It picks up one of the very first cases that he did, which was uh, Connecticut versus uh, Joseph Spell, the state of Connecticut versus Joseph Spell. And so what you got is almost like a modernized version, if you will, of uh, To Kill a Mockingbird to a degree. But this is sort of a racial situation going on up north not in the south this is in connecticut not in the south so that was an interesting juxtaposition because usually whenever they show these films it's always it's always in the south it's these people down in alabama and arkansas and mississippi and texas backwards well this is in connecticut showing how some folks could try to uh take up a guy and create a story to make it look like this African-American Joseph Spell, who's played by Curling, uh, Sterling K. Brown, who was also in Black Panther as Black Panther's uncle, right? So Chadwick and Sterling Brown are together again. And it's a, this story of this socialite who claims that Joseph Spell uh, raped her, mm-hmm. which, of course, I won't tell you the story. You'll have to watch it. They go through these series of twists and turns. So it's a great courtroom drama. So if you like those courtroom dramas that are pretty intense, you like it. Now, it also stars Josh Gad, a comedian who plays his uh, Jewish attorney buddy in this film. And then it has, who doesn't want to look at Kate Hudson in this as well? And James Cronwell and Dan Stevens is is in this film. So you'll love Marshall in the sense that you're rooting for it. You're also watching the craft of once again, and I'll talk about him later, um, you're talking about Chadwick Boseman again. So you talk about first he played uh jackie robinson then he played james brown and now thurgood marshall and so thurgood marshall was a pretty serious man but also a funny man and a very big man in stature and bozeman's only six foot so it was kind of interesting that they took a guy who doesn't really look anything like thurgood marshall but seeing chadwick anyway playing thurgood marshall was was incredible so this is a good film the sad part was is it it the good part is it premiered at, at howard University. They're trying to show this film to kind of get you know people excited about it, but the sad part was it only grossed ten million dollars on a budget of twelve million. Oh, and this is one of those films that you should see because it belongs in there with, you know, To Kill a Mockingbird, but a modernized version, but still in the past. So you get to see an attorney who couldn't even argue the case because he was black. Mm. That's mm. why you had to have Josh Gad. The Jewish lawyer do all the, the stand in for him, and he's and so it's interesting watching him giving him notes like say this, say this, and Josh Gad's character is sitting there going, thinking he's smart, trying to capture them, and with a line of questioning, and you can see you know Chad explaining Thurgood, and he's sitting there going, no, this, and because the judge is like, if you say one word, you're out of here. Yeah. I'll hold you in contempt of court. Only he can try this case, and you're lucky I let you sit in on the trial so you can imagine he's sitting there and he knows all the arguments well and he's like say this and so there's a little comedy in there as well because you could see josh gad thinks he's all that and then he realizes (laughs) oh this guy's a way better lawyer than me so maybe i should stick with it so that was a great film so if you want that kind of film in your life and you want to learn something about a really good real hero uh, thurgood marshall this is pretty accurate and i think it's pretty good and then well acted for sure Mm -hmm. reginald huddlin is the guy who directed it so you might remember him from some other movies but 
probably on BET, he was the one that made sure that Black Panther, the animated Marvel series, showed up on BET, oh, nice. which I now have that DVD, and I like to watch those six episodes or eight episodes. It's pretty awesome. So Reginald Hundlin is pretty awesome. So with that... That's what we have recently just seen. So now, ladies and gentlemen, I know what you want to do. You want us to talk about the main topic, and that's where we're going now. And so the main topic starts just like this. Since we're a movie show, we're going to talk about those who are gone too soon who are in the field of cinema. So it's either a director or an actor or a screenplay or somebody like that. And as always, we start with the film Samurai. All right. Gone too soon. Who is it? Gone too soon. First of all, I'm going to talk about a little bit about Anton Yelkin, a uh, very young actor, born March 1989 mm -hmm. in Leningrad, Russia, which is now St. Petersburg. Uh, okay. He was a Russian and came to the United States, started acting. Of course, you know him as um, Chekhov in the Star Trek films, the J.J. Abrams versions, mm -hmm. uh, Fright Night, uh, The Green Room. The Green Room is a, is a really good film. It's about a young punk band who ends up playing at a a white nationalist club <laughs> mm -hmm. and then they get trapped in there and basically have to fight their way out it's a it's basically it's, it's a horror movie basically but anton yelkin is actually a, an accomplished musician he's a guitar player uh had his own band at one time wow uh one of my favorite films of his is, is a film called like crazy uh him and uh, felicity jones play these two lovers who um meet and fall in love but one of them is is an immigrant has to go back to their country and they try to keep the relationship going but it's so difficult you know um very very good film very heartbreaking film mm. um but he died of a freak accident uh he was checking a gate that was not working in a car he owned uh i think it was an suv rolled and pinned him against this concrete pillar and basically asphyxiated him crushed him wow and um, um yeah this is an actor who was looked at as a up-and-coming actor uh very talented very naturalistic actor and yeah it was one of those potentials you know what could have been as far as you know what he could have done later in his life but yeah he passed away at the age of 27 too young uh to die um wow another actor uh river phoenix uh Joaquin Phoenix's brother, a uh, family of five brothers and sisters. Um, he was born in Madras, Oregon. Uh, from If you know his sisters and brothers' names, you can tell their family was probably hippies. <laughs> like River, uh, Joaquin Phoenix's original name was Leaf Phoenix. Leaf? So it's Leaf, River, uh, I can't remember his sister's name. She has an unusual name too, but... Uh, yeah, he came out in films like Stand By Me, um, My Own Private Idaho with Keanu Reeves. And uh, you might remember Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. The opening of that film is mm. Indiana Jones as a young boy with, like, the Boy Scouts. And mm -hmm. How he got the scar and his, how he developed his fear of snakes. But it was River Phoenix playing him. And, yeah, he does have a kind of resemblance to the style of Harrison Ford. And that's probably why they picked him. Plus, he was a well-known, talented actor. So, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, unfortunately, he died of a drug overdose. He yeah, went out to the Viper Club in Hollywood. and Somebody mm -hmm. passed around cocaine. He wasn't, a real, he wasn't really a drug user. I think he was just doing it socially. Yeah. And then he just, he just passed out outside the club and passed away. Age of 23. 23 gone at 23 uh, but yeah my biggest uh impact that had on me was bruce lee um mm. bruce lee was an icon in every way i mean back in the 70s everybody knew bruce lee he started a whole you know trend of kung fu films crossing over to the mainstream in the united states yeah he already made the big boss and fist of fury the hong kong films but it was enter the dragon that brought him big time to the united states audience as far as films but some people probably already knew him as Cato on the Green Hornet you know mm -hmm. um, and and I read something I'm not sure the details of this but I understood that he developed the television series Kung Fu and he had planned to play it but because you know Hollywood back then it's it's that whole thing of white audiences and right. they don't want to see a Chinese character 
Mm-hmm. They want to anglicize it or whatever, so they got David Carradine. David Carradine, Carradine. yeah. Yes, the, yes, this is true. It's, this is true. It's a big yep. part of the uh, uh, ESPN documentary. Oh, okay, okay. So, yeah, I still got to watch that. But, uh, yeah, Bruce Lee, um, he died of a – he was taking a, a painkiller, and he had an allergic reaction to it, and it swelled his brain. He had a cerebral edema and died. And uh, He died on the set, didn't he? Uh, no, I think he was, well, he was recording some, some vocals on a film he already made, you know, where they go that AD, ADR, where mm-hmm. they record dialogue after the, the film is, is, is filmed. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, he started complaining of a headache and then and the next thing you know, yeah, he, he, he passed away. Um, but yeah, he left, he left a small legacy, but, uh, a huge impact on, on films and the way. I mean, you can see influences of, of Enter the Dragon in other films. Oh, yeah. And, uh, Kill Bill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Bruce Lee is, yeah. I would love to see more of yeah. what he would have done as far as as martial arts films. And, and, and just his philosophy of life, you know. Yeah. He, he created a whole unique style of, of, of martial arts. But it wasn't just the martial arts itself. It was the thinking, you know. He, he had a philosophy. A philosophy of his own and yeah i would have loved to see ex- more exploring of that yeah and i mean he trained you know uh a lot of, a lot of the a lot of the big stars you know just steve mcqueen uh yeah. james coburn mm-hmm. Abdul Jabbar, which came out in game of death with him yeah and, even fought chuck norris, fought chuck norris. <laughs> and one <laughs> <beat his ass. laughs> needless to say yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, that's good. I remember seeing that film Dragon that was done, and it was his Which wife. One? The way of the, oh, the, the Dragon, the Bruce Lee story. Yeah, yeah. yeah the Bruce Lee story, Dragon, James that his Scott wife Jason said Lee. was okay to do. Uh, she gave the go-ahead to go ahead and portray him the way yeah. that they portrayed him in that film, which he seemed pretty angry a lot about being Asian and being oh, yeah. treated the way he was in California back in the 60s and 70s. So I thought that was a pretty interesting take, yes. showing that part about him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all Can't right. How about you, Zach? All right. Uh, so the first one that I wanted to uh, give a remembrance to uh, mm-hmm. is the uh, tr- is one that has had a tremendous effect on both you and I, PJ. Yes. Uh, and that was absolutely our princess Carrie Fisher. Uh. Uh, Carrie was Carrie was just an, a young, expressive actress, and I mean, <laughs> and, and you know, when, when you when you watch her body of work, you you see, like I said, just a great timing, and mm-hmm. uh, you know, just an unbelievable, you know, kind of passion for the work. I mean, if you watch her scene in Blues Brothers, she goes through, <laughs> and then just five minutes of dialogue, yeah. she goes through every possible feeling of expression in just her face, and it's just amazing to watch her work. Yeah, very um, underrated not, actress. And not just and not just as a really great actress, but also was a tremendous writer. I mean, she's a script oh, yeah. doctor on just so much stuff. She knew how to punch up dialogue. She mm. knew how to uh, just basically get the most out of uh, human interaction. Yeah. And and she was unapologetically an addict. I mean, mm. she was just out from it and like, dude, the, I oh. I made some mistakes. Mistakes were made, and these are the mistakes were made, mm. and. And, you know, you can see, you know, the regret and, and being a functioning and recovering uh, alcoholic, drug addict, and things like that. And yeah. she was just unapologetic about it yeah. because, like I said, like, hey, I screwed up. I get, I'm working to get better every day. It was a continuous process. Mm-hmm. And when you hear, you know, when you hear people who got to do Comic Cons with her, you know, mm. just what kind of personality she was because she absolutely, you know, mm. loved shopping and she loved buying gifts for other people. And she was just a really, really giving person, yeah. both on screen and off. Um, you know, ju- uh, and, you know, she's a second generation Hollywood star. Uh, her mom, Debbie Reynolds, who l- literally died the day after Carrie died. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and, and it's just and 83 you know, years old or something yeah. like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's just you know one of it, 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 it's just you know one of those heartbreaking Hollywood stories. But again, like I said, Carrie left such a legacy as both a writer and a film star uh, that, like I said, everyone absolutely loved working with her. 
You know, yeah. everyone from George Lucas to Kevin Smith, just everyone who got to have an impact with her enjoyed what she, who she was and what she was. And I mean, uh, you know, when you watch her work in uh, When Harry Met Sally, The Blues Brothers, yeah. uh, it, it, it's a small film onus. And like I said, we never got our real Princess Leia closure, which That's true. really, really hurt. Mm. It and did. Star Wars it did. And it's the irony here is that. When you think about Star Wars in 1977, the youngest actors on the set were Mark Hamill and, and, and Carrie Fisher. And the fact that one of the youngest would die before Harrison Ford or Peter Mayhew were the guys who were much older, right? That she would die even before them as one of the original five or the original four, right? It's kind of ironic. Yeah. And again, uh, like I said, as a bio writing her biographies, if you go read back Princess Diaries, if you go back and read New Wishful Drinking or uh, Coast Starts on the Edge. Mm hmm She's just, she's she's funny, she's frank, and she was beautiful. Yeah. Uh, the second one that I chose, when you talk about uh, potential, uh, this was an actress that I thought had real potential that was gone too soon, and that was Brittany Murphy. Hmm. Brittany Murphy, uh, you know, had a very young film career, but I mean, when you watched her, she was she was just this big, wonderful ball of frenetic energy, huge eyes, full lips, and just mm -hmm. funny. Yeah. She had really, really wonderful timing. And I mean, when uh, getting to see her uh, in Clueless, getting to see her in a whole bunch of romantic comedies. And when you look at her look at her work as a voiceover artist, she's Luann on King of the Hill. Yeah. And the reason why she got the role in King of the Hill was because she read it like no one else. She read it like a pure bubblehead. And she's yeah. just funny as hell. She was, she, she's a New Jersey girl who made a Texan famous. Even that oh. first film she made with Michael Douglas, where she was like a, in a psychiatric ward, and she had no dialogue because she didn't speak. Yeah. Just her facial expression. and I mean, she could act just with her face and her eyes. Yeah. yeah. Incredible eyes. Yeah, you, you watch her as a lost girl and girl interrupted, and it's mm -hmm. just... It, 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 she, she could break your heart. She could make you laugh. She was just one of those actresses who I think never really got to live up to her potential because she... I, I think she chose, you know, goofy and romantic comedies and things like that, but I think... She was growing as an actress, and it was really kind of a tragedy to watch her get struck down like she was because she had big things on her right on her horizon. Because, like I said, she could trans. She was, yeah, like I said, aging into you know just wonderful roles. I mean, even yeah. Sin City, you know, she, she's she's just magnetic. I, you know, mm -hmm. absolutely, just someone who I enjoyed watching, and that you know, I truly miss. Mm -hmm. The third one that I chose, um, I chose because. I loved his presence on screen. And like I said, I'm a big fan of the uh, uh, National Lampoon uh, family of comedians, and I absolutely I had to choose John Belushi. Yeah. Belushi, yep. who, you know, could say more with his eyebrows than anyone <laughs> on the planet. <laughs> uh, you know, when you, when you watch him in Animal House, when you watch mm. him in The Blues Brothers, mm. you know, it, the man can do physicality. The man can do uh, dialogue. The man can, can be, the man can be sincere. He was great. He was wonderful in Continental Divide. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you watch him in Neighbors, and he's way off the chain with uh, 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 Dan Aykroyd trying to be buttoned down. And then you see, you know, uh, the Blues Brothers, which is by far still one of my favorite films of all time. And you see mm -hmm. him, uh, you know, as a singer and as a performer and things like that. And you watch his work on Saturday Night Live. Everything about the guy. You really wanted to enjoy him, and and I mean, like I said, you know, when when you think about physical big men, John was absolutely that. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, when, yeah. You when you watch him on screen, it, it, it's just, I would have loved to have seen what he, we would have done with given more because he was, you know, trying to expand as an actor, as a comedian. I like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it's possible he could have been a great writer, a great director, and things like that. You see mm -hmm. these folks who you wonder what they could have been once they're gone mm. because they had such unlimited talent and potential it was just amazing to watch them on screen and like i said they belonged to us and john was one of those who who, who you literally wanted to sit down one of my favorite belushi stories <laughs> is that on the set of the blues brothers he gets lost mm -hmm. like they can't find him they can't find him they can't find him mm -hmm. so finally uh an actor uh some guy in canada uh or new york or whatever or Chicago calls up, calls up the set and says, "Hey, I've got John Belushi on my couch." <laughs> Literally, John Belushi walked in, got drunk, and passed it on this dude's couch, <laughs> and that was who he was. He just basically like <laughs> John just walked in and be at home anywhere, and then it and they said, "Yeah, I got John here. You can 
pick him up, whatever. Just it, it, it's just, there are so many great Bellucci stories no. because of his excess, but still, the guy was just entertaining as all hell. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I get that, and that's again one of the biggest things about this gone too soon, ladies and gentlemen, is that you're just wondering what else would they have done mm-hmm. had they not been taken so early. And so, with mine, I, all three of these hurt. All three of these hurt for different reasons, though. And the, and the first gentleman that I picked. And you guys know him very well at this point in the stage of the game. This would be Heath Andrew Ledger. Mm. Born on April 4th, 1979. Died January 22nd, 2008. This guy already, an Australian actor, who was also a video director and also a music video guy as well as, as a photographer. So he was a guy who was good in front of the camera as well as behind the camera. That was the aspiration that we would have seen. The movies he would have directed if he was still alive. And so he's been part of 19 different films, most notably, you know, The Ten Things uh, That I Hate About You, Monster's Ball, The Dark Knight, obviously, Brokeback Mountain, just a few of them. And, of course, he won an award posthumously for uh, Best Supporting Actor for Dark Knight. And then the other film that people don't know actually was his last film because it was being filmed right as Dark Knight was wrapping up, which was The Imaginarian of Dr. Um, Parnassus. Parnassus. That's right. Oh, I love and that film. Yes, another great film. And he also got an award for that. The Academy Award, though, was for uh, The Dark Knight, and he also got a Golden Globe. This is incredible because if anybody watches The Dark Knight, there's no way on earth you can watch that film and go, which one was Heath Ledger again? What, <laughs> what did he do? Right? In this film, this is a guy who's the villain. The focus is not him, but he dominates the superhero in this film. Though he loses, spoiler alert, to to the superhero. And as good as Christian Bale was, I thought, was a great Batman. You know, people make fun of the voice. But I think the build, the stature, the stoicness, to me, Christian Bale was better than Keaton. I know some people want to fight me. That's okay. You can at me online. It's all right. But I'm going to still go with Christian Bale. But in all of that, and even with the greatness of of the guy that was playing uh, Alfred, I'm forgetting his name. Michael Caine. Michael Caine. This is who Heath Ledger was up against. These two guys. Gary Oldman. Gary Oldman. And he rocked it. He rocked it completely, right? And we loved Capone as the villain in the first one in Scarface, or uh, uh, Scarecrow. But here he comes. And then he has to fill in or do better than what Jack Nicholson had already done in the first Batman. And I'll, I'll say that you just are mesmerized every time he's on screen. Every time, you, you, and you can't not watch this. You can you cannot watch this movie too many times. He made me nervous when I or I watched him that yes. especially that first scene when he makes his <laughs> entrance with all the guys sitting around the tables. Yes, I just got like on the edge of my seat just listening to him because you yeah. never knew what this guy was going to do. Oh. He was so into the character that you were mm-hmm. he was dangerous. You know? Yes, you, you knew he would just go off. Absolutely dangerous. And so this guy, Heath yeah. Ledger, is my first one gone at the age of twenty eight years mm-hmm. old. Um, another guy, love this guy. I've talked about it before. Um, he's one of the few guys that are on our list. That's actually, I haven't lived up to his age yet. So there's only three people on this list that I haven't gotten to their age yet. And this would be the great Robin Williams himself. This guy born in July 21st in 1951 up died August 11th, 2014. So this is his past month. He died actor who was a comedian first, who was because he was a great comedian, was selected to be on a TV show called Mork and Mindy back in the 70s. There is no comedian that's quicker, more impromptu, and can just out, out, just out, out, just make you out and out just laugh your butt off and not know why you're laughing because he just did some weird thing and pulled it out of the right side of his brain. The other time he pulled it from the left side of his brain, but it made sense in the context of what he was doing. I mean, this guy, no one's quicker. No one's he could teach classes on how to be an impromptu uh, funny man, stand up guy, because he was so good. And then people didn't think he could be as good as he could be as an actor. Yet, look at all the great films he was in and won an Academy Award. So, you're, you're in Goodwill Hunting, you're in Awakenings, you're in Good Morning Vietnam. This is a stand up comedian mm-hmm. who's this dramatic in a role. So, when Robin Williams dies of suicide, that was hard to take because this is the guy who should have been the happiest guy in the world, you would think, because of what he could do. But underneath all of that was his pain 
and this hurt. And so now he would just deflect with what you saw on the outside. The tragic clown thing. You know? Yeah, and I mean, when, when he passed, he was diagnosed with a disease that was going to take away his ability to work. Yeah. He was diagnosed, I think, I think I can't remember if it was Lou Gehrig's or ALS or something like that, but, or MS, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, when he, I think one of the things that kind of took him was that he wasn't going to be able to do what he does. Yeah. You know, which was, you know, to move and make people laugh. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, all of this work, you could watch all of it. You could watch Patch Adams. I don't even think he, Moscow on the Hudson even. I mean, just his range was ridiculous. Oh, my God. Your one-hour photo, like one of the <laughs> most dark movies. You're playing a dark character like that. He could do it all, man. He's yeah. so. Yeah. Yep. He could so, do it. Man, I just would love to have seen what this guy would have done later on in roles, like what other roles he might have taken on just to see what he might have done. And then finally, probably more recently, we're all still shocked about this one, and that would be Chadwick Boseman, mm, yeah. the Black Panther himself, dead at 43, born in 76. And this is a guy, short movie list, but every last one of the movie roles that he chose were top-notch, iconic African-American uh, characters in American history. So you're playing Jackie Robinson, who broke the color barrier, so you're a, a player. You then played James Brown, one of the greatest entertainers and civil rights activists in the 60s. Then you get to play Thorgood Marshall. Again, we talked about that just a little bit earlier. The, he's the lawyer then. And then he gets to play the most iconic black superhero, the first black superhero, not an African-American. That would be Falcon, but first black superhero in comics, thanks to Kirby and um, Stan Lee, they gave us Black Panther, and then the one guy I thought before this happened, and you can ask Horror Mike, I told him, I said, the person they should get to play this is Chadwick Boseman. And I said that after watching him play Jackie Robinson, you know, and also, uh, of course, uh, James Brown, because I saw that this guy, when you can play Jackie Robinson, who's a very stoic guy, and then turn on your next movie and play the most flamboyant guy, <laughs> James Brown, with all his dancing and moves and his, <laughs> and hip man, and all that stuff, you got range, because those are two oh. completely different guys. And then it makes sense how he could translate that into a king of Wakanda, you know, Wakanda forever. So Chadwick Boseman, once again, still feeling that gone way too soon. Uh, yeah. Solid guy. Right. Yeah. And I mean, he was part of doing what a lot of folks said couldn't be done, and that was to help bring a, help bring a black a black cast into, you know, pop culture phenomenon. Saying the make a blockbuster film with people wanting to go see it around the yes. corner. And seeing it over and over again, I mean, that's the that was the impact that this guy had. And he, you know, he never wanted to be that guy. He always wanted to be the guy pulling the next one up, man. Yeah, absolutely. And this is a guy who gave a great Howard commencement speech to his alma mater. And this is a guy who was struggling since 2016 with a disease that, that's eaten him whole on the inside. And yet he's showing up to all these. I remember when he did Black Panther, he was showing up to all, seeing all these kids that had cancer. Mm -hmm. Right, because we know Chadwick died of uh, eventually submitted to colon cancer, but he was seeing all these kids that were in the hospital, and I never made the connection. Like mm -hmm. I was thinking, why is he going to see all these kids with cancer? It's because he knows something about it himself, yeah. and so the fact that he never complained, never did any of that stuff, he just worked, and he tried to work harder than the next person. It's just amazing. So anything that you can watch on Chadwick Boseman right now, any tribute, just listen to the guys that were his teammates from Marvel. Look at what Chris Evans says about him. Look what all those guys say that who worked with him. They said he just brought this thing with him. Like he just had, when he walked into the room, you just knew this guy's got skills. I don't know how he's going to do it. He was a presence. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So. <laughs> One of the few that had it. Mm -hmm. He had it. So it's gone too soon because I would have loved to have seen what he would have done further. Yeah. And by the way, he went to Howard to be a director, not an actor, mm. and turned out. He took the route of going acting, and so I would love to see what he would have done to direct oh, a movie. would have been great. Yeah. So let's open this up, because while we're talking about these, and again, sad that they're gone, but love that they had a legacy that they left behind that we can go look at and maybe inspire to be even better. But let's look at topic B, where we're going to open it up a little bit, and let's look at those celebrities, whether it's in sports or whether it's in anything other than movies that also died too soon. And so, Film Samurai, who do you have? All right. Uh, first one I have is Lane Frost. He was a born in 1963 in La Junta, Colorado. Became a bull rider. He uh, joined the PRCA bull riding circuit all over the United States. Um, 1982, he became a world champion at the age of 24. Uh, you might... If you ever saw the movie Eight Seconds, mm. it's a really good depiction of his 
his life, his short life. Um, he died at the age of 25. Wow. Uh, he was killed doing the thing he loved. Uh, he was bull riding. Uh, mm. You know, you ride as, as much as you can. The eight seconds is the mark. that you, It's like a perfect score, you know. He, he jumped off the bull, and the bull turned and hit him from the back Ooh. with a horn. Broke his ri- all his ribs. Oh. And, uh, and then when he fell down, the ribs punctured his lungs and his heart. Mm. ended up dying that way but uh but in just a short period of time like everybody admired this guy because he was you know one of the young up-and-coming bull riders and um, because of him one of his partners his traveling partner cody lambert created that vest that all the bull riders wear now it's like it's almost like a bulletproof vest very heavy so when they fall off you know it, it keeps them from keeps their bodies you know from getting crushed or shattered mm-hmm. i mean bull riders it's one of the most dangerous sports is you're either going to get gored or you're going to get stepped on or you're just going to get, you know, just landing on the ground from yeah. that height, you know, yeah. on your back or something, and then risking the bull stepping on you. I mean, according to the movie, he got stepped on right in between the legs, and that wow. had to have been like, ugh. oh. So, yeah, he finally got inducted into the Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame, and, uh, yeah, too too young to be uh, passed, passed away in 1989. Uh, my second I picked was uh, Selena Quintanilla uh, <laughs> from Lake Jackson, Texas. She was born mm. in 1971, and uh, she was known as the queen of Tejano music. And she, at at the height of her, before she, right before she passed away, she was just about the, to make that crossover into the mainstream. Mm-hmm. Uh, her her family was from South Texas. They were Mexican American. Mm-hmm. They were. <laughs> In the movie Selena, the the dad uh, played by um, Edward James Almost, he has this line of, you know, they were not quite Mexican enough to be Mexican and not quite white enough to be white. You know? mm. So they were just kind of like in that mid, you know. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, she was inspired by, you know, the corritos and the old uh, Mexican tunes. Her her dad was almost like the, uh, not many like the father of Michael Jackson, who basically took all his kids, you know, his sis- the her sister was... A guitar player their brother was a drummer and you know every, the whole family was the band you know and they traveled around they played shows everywhere until they got huge she was one of the first to well, i guess latin american singers that to, to play the astrodome and sold it out mm-hmm. the astrodome is huge in mm-hmm. houston but yeah she was unfortunately killed by uh a manager that or ex-manager that was running her boutiques because not only was she a singer but she was a clothes designer she had her own makeup line that was one of the best-selling celebrity makeup lines uh, hmm. mac um and yeah she had these stores in, in corpus christi where she lived and uh yeah unfortunately this this woman uh shot her because she was uh, selena was confronting her about missing money and yeah. funds and stuff and uh yeah she died at the age of 23 too way too young yeah uh my last one i want to talk about is richie valance richard valenzuela uh, he was born in this uh Pacoma uh, area of Los Angeles, uh, like the San Fernando Valley. Mm-hmm. Um, he he was inspired by the mariachi music. Uh, very young m- musician who um, who just came up and was immediately you know th- he had an obvious talent right away. I mean he he came out with some classics back then. Uh, of course, they made him na- change his name to Richie Valance. Everybody knows him as Richie Valance. But um, he came out, you know, the big hits, La Bamba. Everybody knows La Bamba, right? Sure. But La Bamba is really not an original tune. It was it was like an old folk folk tune mm-hmm. back in Mexican music, and uh, he turned it into a mainstream rock and rock and roll hit. You know, he's yeah. inspired by rockabilly as well. Yeah. And uh, Donna, you know that song, uh, "Come On, Let's Go," is probably one that was redone by like the Ramones and other bands. Uh, but yeah, he, he died in a plane crash is probably very famous. One of the famous stories told is that uh, he, Buddy Holly and JP Richardson, the big bopper who was suffering from, uh, he had the flu. Mm-hmm. And so somebody gave up Tommy also uh, who had Tommy's uh, club in downtown Dallas. Uh, he gave up his seat to him because he was so sick and Richie won a toy cost to get on the plane. And so it's Buddy Holly, Richie, and 
those three took off from this after they played a show in Iowa in the middle mm. of winter, <laughs> and mm -hmm. the plane took off and then immediately crashed. And uh, yeah, that, that song, "The Day the Music Died," that was like, or, or what was that song? American uh, Pie. American, American Pie. Pie was yeah, basically about that. Uh, but yeah, seventeen years old. Wow, unbelievable. That seventeen. Guy. Seventeen. And That's... can you imagine the the <laughs> tunes he would have come out with yeah. as he grew older? And matured as a musician and an artist and a writer, you know, he, he there was so much potential there, and just the just the little music he left was it was great, you know. It was, yeah. You could tell he was already talented. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Tragic. Good stuff. How about you, K Zach? All right. Uh, so the first one I'm going to talk about uh, was let's face it that. If I'm gonna choose, if I'm gonna choose athletes, I'm gonna choose an athlete that was not only uh, a spectacle but also a tremendous human being. And that, of course, was when I say tremendous, I mean it in both the literal and figurative sense. And that's Andre the Giant. <laughs> 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 yes. uh, you never really understand how big seven foot five inches, five hundred pounds is, unless you see it in person. I yeah. got to see the man wrestle at the end of his career oh, once in God. person. That, uh, that watching awesome. him wrestle, you know, a squash match against the Ultimate Warrior. And, um, <laughs> Ultimate Warrior. Um, watching, watching him come down to the ring and watching him enter the ring and watching him take up space in that ring, the man was just massive. And the thing was is that man. with Andre, mm -hmm. yeah, with, with Andre, um, uh, it's hard to say because... Uh, like I said, you you really don't understand how big he is until you see him in the life. And when you, and I mean, this is a guy who can never escape being seven foot five, five hundred pounds, and an athlete. Yep. And when you're in a sport like professional wrestling, where you are you are your personality, you are out there. You're not putting you can't put on a helmet, you can't put on pants, you can't hide, and you really can't hide when you're seven foot five inches. Um, and you know when you get to hear the stories of his life. The thing that the guy wanted wanted to do most was to make people happy, and that's what he did. When you watch him in The Princess Bride, uh, you know, uh, you see, you know, just you know how heartwarming, but how dangerous the man was. And I mean, he's in a lot of pain in that movie because he's he's severely needing back surgery. But the thing is, uh, you know, when you hear the stories about you know Robin Wright on on the set, you know, she she they're fil they're filming this in like the middle of winter and. Uh, uh, ribbon or whatever, and she's freezing. Andre takes and puts his giant hand on her head, and it just, you know, just almost engulfs it. And he's keeping her warm just by doing this. Um, when you hear, when, there are just so many great stories about Andre because, you know, like I said, he was a guy who wanted to make people happy, and he was because, he you know, heart. He, he's, he's willing to work with people, but when you make a giant mad, <laughs> you, you make a giant mad. Um, there were some guys that were, uh, you know, uh, giving him shit in a, in a bar in New York. They go to get in their car. This is four guys in like an AMC Grumbler or something like that. <laughs> Andre walks out and turns the car over. Fix it up. Oh, my God. I mean, that, that, he's picking up, you know, 400, 150-pound men plus a 300-pound, plus, a, you know, a 1,500-pound car and flipping it over. Yeah. The man, the man could make you look really bad if he wanted to. He could also make you look really good if he wanted to. Yeah. He was an entertainer. Yep. He, was a, he was a wonderful human being, and he was just, you know, a great athlete. He really could work. He didn't have to lift weights. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but like I said, he could do amazing things in the ring, but he could also do amazing things in life, and that's what he was. And it was a shame to watch him, you know, pass away at 45 because giants don't live long. Mm -hmm. uh, go check if you get a chance. Go check out the HBO documentary on him. Uh, it's really fantastic, or the cop, or the graphic novel uh, written about him. Will do. Um, oh. The second one that I chose, um, I'm a little surprised this one wasn't on your list, PJ. But I, because I saw who you chose, mm -hmm. uh, but of course I went with Freddie Mercury. Mm -hmm. uh, watching this man on stage, watching him do what he does, listening to his voice. You could actually see him take a crowd in the palm of his hand with that mm -hmm. gorgeous voice. A Zan a Zanzibarian uh, transplant to England um, mm -hmm. uh, who, you know, had too many teeth, just a goofy-looking kid. 
with the most magnetic voice ever, with the mo with the most flamboyant personality ever. He really mm -hmm. defined what it meant to be a front man mm -hmm. in the seventies. Okay. I yep. mean, you you go watch Boy Meets Rhapsody, but I mean, the 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 if the one that I would point to is that there's two minutes and thirty seconds of uh, Queen live at Wembley Stadium. Mm -hmm. And it's it, it's him doing the vocal warm ups. It's him doing his call and response to the crowd. Yeah. And you see Wembley Stadium. This is probably you know, you know, one hundred and fifty thousand people or something like that. I mean, just a huge amount of people singing along with him in response to him, following his every word, following his motions. And you watch him on and you watch him on stage. You hear him in an arena, and it's just amazing. Uh, Freddie Mercury was a beautiful human being, and like I said. Uh, and his tragic death from AIDS really, mm -hmm. you know, call it, I think, to the forefront. Call mm -hmm. it and say, you know, mm -hmm. uh, this is someone who we all loved and cared about. And his, pres and his presence leaving us is, you know, one of the great tragedies of the world. Because, yes. again, he was a voice that uh, was always beautiful. And uh, it, it's a tragic, it was tragic to watch it end the way it did just because, you know, Freddie was Freddie. And uh, it, it was a life well lived, but you know, like I said, it was just a huge impact when he passed. The third one I chose, I can't think of anyone who had who's had more impact on no, not only creativity, but also uh, in children's education with the way it was done, and that, of course, was Jim Henson. Mm. Uh, mm. Jim, the, Jim, the creator of the Muppets, you know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, like I said, he, he introduced, he reintroduced old comedy. He, mm -hmm. he reintroduced the variety show, mm -hmm. uh, and he did it with puppetry. But I mean, if you not, but I mean, you know, beyond the Muppets, beyond Sesame Street, you go take a look at what he was able to do with films like Labyrinth, with films like The Dark Crystal. Mm -hmm. um, you look at his legacy. I mean, his, his, there there's a thing called the Muppet Stitch, where in puppetry, where it's to make the lines invisible. Mm -hmm. For him to have, you know, just that kind of impact, and just the way he sewed something really spoke words for what he was doing because again he was he was a real creative genius I and mean, if you go back and watch stuff like the storyteller series and things like that yeah he just made things that you wouldn't think possible yeah. visible to the yeah. eye. Um, and you know when you look at the influence on things like uh, Sesame Street and things like that you just you understand the gravity of what he was able to bring to the world giving other people uh, a voice and giving you know giving inanimate objects life I mean that, uh, and you know when you hear about his funeral and things like that, and hear, seeing all these wonderful things like it's an easy being green sung by Big Bird and things like that, you know, yeah, characters, characters and Muppets and things like that, it really just is a phenomenal speak, uh, yeah. speak to me, speaks yeah. to me, of what the power of creativity can do. Yep. Yes, no, I love that. That's a that's a great list actually, and I will say for my three then real fast. Um, there was a man named Robert Nesta Marley, born mm. on February 6, 1945. He succumbed in May um, to, believe it or not, skin cancer, melanoma. He was 36 years old. So skin cancer takes this dude. Mm. Bob Marley is ranked in the top 10 of greatest musicians of all times. A, th a fourth of the m music that you heard in this country that was reggae is his music. You know, and he inspired a whole bunch of people. He started out, he wanted to be like the Temptations. There's pictures of him without the dreads in a black suit, white shirt, black tie, because he was, he was so enamored with American culture and American music. But they had different things going over there where he's from, Trenchtown, right? Mm -hmm. So in Jamaica, they had a lot of civil unrest, and he decided to become this poet. He, he was this shot, prophet, he? And he was time. shot. Yeah, he's yeah. been shot before. So ironically with the song that he was doing with I Shot the Sheriff and whatnot and all this other stuff going on. But Bob Marley was the guy who could take that guitar and, and when he sang about some specific social issue or whatever it was, you believed it and you believed you were going through it while he was singing about it. So when you think about Rasta Man vibrations, when you think about war, where he says, until the color of a man's skin is of no more significance than the color of his eyes, there'll be war. That's the kind of lyrics this guy was writing. 
And so when you go back and listen to Prophet Man, Rastaman, you know, this was who Bob Marley was. And so if you missed it, if you didn't find out much about reggae, uh, you could start easily with him before you move on to Steel Pulse and Black Uru and his son, Ziggy Marley, and the Melody Makers mm. that are out there as well. So he ended up dying, like I said, at age 36. And so this year he would have been 75 um, if he was around today. So today they're, ha they're having the 75th anniversary. It started in February, but they'll probably be doing it all year for Bob Nesta Marley. And another one, uh, gone too soon again, Christopher George Latore Wallace. You will know him as Biggie Smalls, the notorious B.I.G. So he's killed, it's homicide by gunshots, 24 years old. 24 years old one of the top five rappers of all time and this will make some people mad but better than tupac for sure and mm. yes tupac was west coast but I, but hip-hop was started in the east coast it was started in the dark and the grime of brooklyn and the pro projects of bowling green the five boroughs all that stuff it was gritty it was never meant to be oh we've got everything sing songy happy happy it was how do we make a life while living here in what looks like <laughs> Beirut. And so when you hear the early rap songs and when you hear these stories of how he overcame, even though he did some drug selling at some point, but it was to feed his daughter and then eventually to get where he was. And then that lyrical style is smooth. So uh, my number one rapper all time will always be Rakim, but number two or number three definitely has to be Biggie. And I don't even have Tupac in the top five. Hmm. You know, I don't because Tupac doubled his voice and all that stuff. To me, a great rapper doesn't have to do that. It's their voice, it's their flow, and it's their style, right? And Notorious B.I.G. had all of that. And so hmm. if you want to listen to some good hip hop, good flows and styles and great wordplay, you got to listen to Christopher, who is Biggie Smalls gone too soon at the age of 24 and then finally i have to give you all this one um this is another one that's kind of controversial i'll say it too uh prince rogers nelson okay guy born up in minnesota june 7 1958 passed away april 21st 2016 this guy i just want you to know wasn't just a singer songwriter but he's also a musician a record producer uh dancer actor and filmmaker he did all of that. So when people say who's the king of pop, they always say Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson could only do one thing. Prince can play every instrument. And he's a showman. And he can dance. And he can act. And he can play music for other people and produce their albums, which he did with Vanity Six. So yes, you could argue that Michael was great because he only had one thing to do and he nailed it. He is obviously a great showman and he could get people to do whatever and he could get people to faint. I've been to both a Michael Jordan, a Mi Michael Jordan, Michael Jackson concert, and I've been to a Prince concert. Michael Jackson is ridiculous because he could just say die and people would fall over and die because people, he just had people eating from his hands. But when you watch Prince, you're blown away because this guy could sing Purple Rain, get up, go to the piano and play it on the piano, get up and play the bass parts to Purple Rain, then go over, play the guitar part for Purple Rain. It didn't matter. He could play every instrument, and this guy was a showman himself. He would do the splits. He'd twirl that microphone around. He'd do all this stuff, all at what five Harry foot James nothing. James Brown life in his yeah. style of dancing and moving. Yes, so he this was so little. I mean, he's like so five little. Feet tall or something. Yes, and I remember when he Very first thin. came out, and they because he's a guitarist, right? He opened, believe it or not, for the Rolling Stones. <laughs> Right, because they thought, okay, guitarist would rock. We got to get him, you know, in there. Even though he mixed funk, blues, and mm -hmm. all of that, but he wore the purple because of Jimi Hendrix. Mm -hmm. Right, he was a big Jimi Hendrix fan, but he opened for the Rolling Stones and he got booed because he came out in a camisole. Because we know he's always into androgyny, just like David Bowie was. Mm -hmm. Right, so this guy has well over sold well over 136 million copies of his music and he is Rolling Stones has him in the top three and he's got a vault of music that he never even released. never even released yeah yes God. and he could find talent in other people and pull it out of them Sheila E Vanity Six there, there are more so to be able to play with Prince if you're a musician to play at his club that he had up there in Minnesota what is it, Dream of the Pearls something or something like street, that? Something Street. Yeah. That club, yeah. yeah. If you could... I Purple Rain. It's, <laughs> man, it still holds up. It's so... Yeah. He's such a magnetic performer, and you're just enthralled watching him. It's like going... It's like a religious experience in a way, you know. It's, it's it is. The way he moves, the way he sings, the power he has, his vocals. Yeah. His, his poetry, his words. Mm -hmm. you know, he's just, like, incredible. 
songs, you know. Yeah. God. Yeah. Some Houston, of the greatest albums. And then his movie, Purple Rain, was one of the best movies, one of the most popular movies. And just, mm -hmm. the, I mean, just almost everything he touched. If people talk about musical genius, this is it. This is it. This guy was a musical genius. He wasn't just hanging on one He was a perfectionist, talent. too. And oh. when he made his musicians practice, they had to hit every note perfectly. And yep. they had to dance while they played their songs. So mm -hmm. it was like, he's a choreographer, too. Yeah. So he made sure that everybody was in sync and mm -hmm. nobody just went off and played their own little solo or anything. No, he, he had to have it perfect. He's like Frank Zappa in a way. Yeah. Frank Zappa was like that. And I'll say one last thing about Prince as well. You have to think about the time that he was coming up as well, because this is a guy who could play guitar. Mm -hmm. He could play guitar, but most bands back then were pop funk bands, right? Yeah. Like Cameo, stuff like that. But he was much deeper than bubblegum pop, pop music. Mm -hmm. He was as good as Earth, Wind and Fire, but that was a whole bunch of people. He was one person that was as good as the whole band, Earth, Wind and Fire. Mm -hmm. So they didn't know how to market this guy because they were like, but he's playing guitar, most pop acts, Black African American acts, R&B acts aren't usually playing guitar and could play metal. They're just singing and dancing. Right, right. they're singing, they're dancing. There's great, you know, choruses, that sort of stuff. Bebop kind of getting into it. So they didn't have, they didn't know how to market this guy at first. And then he's dressing in a camisole. <laughs> so it's like, who are you, dude? You're in all this purple. You're in a camisole. You can play metal with the best of them. Mm -hmm. But how do we even market you? So they just they were trying to get that sound down. And then he just kind of said, no, it's punk, it's punk, funk, pop and uh just soul music all mixed in together right so yeah and one guy doing it not a whole band right yeah. <laughs> so that's amazing right so uh prince rogers nelson gone at 57 couldn't believe it mm -hmm. so what did you guys think you guys are watching us here you saw us talk about this were there some actors maybe some musicians that you're that are your fave that you felt were gone too soon as well well let us know in the comment section reach out to us you can find us on youtube as well as on this facebook page for fulfillment um at this time it's time for us to do those shout outs and just to give you a pre sneak preview before the shout outs, we're going straight Halloween and horror. So I hope you like Halloween and horror because the next couple of shows, that's what we're going to do. And we're going to bring back fan favorite Horror Mike to be there. Now, let's jump into my favorite time of the year. <laughs> yes, yes, sir. <laughs> All right. Uh, just shout out to my son, uh, Matt, and my daughter, Nicole. Uh, just saw him last weekend. Great time with him. Uh, cousins out in California, Stella Joel. Um, all my Twitter friends who are giving me great recommendations and uh, just good movie talk. Yeah. Love it. Absolutely. <laughs> KZ. Shout outs to all our uh, uh, shows here on uh, DallasOnAir.com, uh, including uh, Best for Business, including 12 Pack, including DFW Raw, and of course the shows that are on opposite, opposite Sundays from us, and that's uh, the uh, Rancor Pit, uh, Air, which you can watch second and fourth Sundays uh, around this time. Uh, Figments is going to be coming back in October, and of course next week we bring you Isle of Toys. Uh, we've always got great stuff here on DallasOnAir.com, and please, 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 we are 50 days from. Uh, electing uh, from our next election please 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 register to vote uh, if you're in if you're in the state of texas you must be registered by october 5th early voting starts october 13th get in er get in early get your vote in make it count this counts more than ever we're not going to tell you who because we're not a political show but you look at That's the right. makeup of this show and you can probably put together <laughs> who and what we're supporting but please 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 make your voice heard go vote this year, it counts more than ever. That's right. And so my shout outs I want to give out to for Horror Mike, who will be here next week. Sean Presley, who's also checked two us weeks. out. Uh, two weeks. That's right. Sorry about that. Two weeks. Uh, Sean Presley, Lauren Weedauer, Tristan Frazier, Harry Thomas, Troy Ross, Michael Paul, Daniel Meza, Mad Mel, Eddie, and Eddie Medina, of course, uh, Cole, and, mm -hmm. and Stephanie Crane, Scott Laney and Sandra. So that's going to do it this time. We'll see you September 27th, and we will be giving you a spooky good time. Woo! <laughs> Kick that music. <laughs> Sayonara. Wash your hands. Wear your mask. Damn it. <laughs> Blow your nose. Don't be Karen. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely don't be a Karen. <laughs>